And so, anyway, without further ado, I want to have Brother Eric come and share the word. Um, if Before he comes up, uh, can I have just your son just to pray? Bro, uh, this young kid right here, the hand of God is so strongly upon him. Why don't you just pray for the service and, and pray for your papa before he comes up. Can, can we give this little kid a hand? Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for this service, God. And I ask that you would just do transforming, God. You just do miracles, Lord. God, things that we didn't even expect, Lord. God, that you would transform hearts, Jesus. That you would help our hearts to just focus on you. That everything else, every other distraction would just be silenced in Jesus' name. God, that you would help us to understand your word that's going to be spoken today. Lord, I bless my dad, and I ask that you would just speak through him, the spirit would speak through him, that it wouldn't even be he, him speaking, but just you speaking through him, God. And I thank you, God, for just helping each ear here, Lord, just to listen and understand God and walk away and just remember it and even linger in it and just remember it throughout the day, God, that we wouldn't forget it, Lord, like just forgetting what we look like in a mirror, but God, that we would remember what you said through this word today, right now, and that we wouldn't be in a hurry, as Pastor was saying, we wouldn't be in a hurry, but we would be listening to what you have to say in Jesus' name. Praise God. Well, good morning. It's a real honor and a joy to be with you this uh, Resurrection Day. What a blessing. We, uh, our family has lived in the Philippines for 17, 18 years. And um, we're kind of light-colored, but we're really Filipino. <laughs> So we can, uh, we can throw down some chicken and rice, some fish, all the Filipino dishes, but it's really a blessing to be here today. We, I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony, but I believe I, I do have a word for you today. And, you know, I'm expecting the Holy Spirit to, to speak to each and every one of us and, and just to have His way. I believe the church is in a place that needs to, as Pastor Troy just said, linger in the presence of God. Uh, essentially what I'm going to be talking about today is prayer. You know, because it's what Jesus did and it's what he's been doing for quite some time. <laughs> and I'll get into more of that in just a moment. You know, as I uh, was saying, we've lived in the Philippines for a while now, and we really love being missionaries. Uh, it's, it's an honor. You know, I know sometimes the word missionary can be a bad word, depending on where people are in the world. But I like the biblical term of being a, a sent out one, one that basically are ministers of reconciliation, not ministers of control, not ministers of demand or snuffing out cultures, but people who teach biblical principles so that as we plant and water seeds, God begins to make things grow. See, if you don't have a, an encounter with God, but you just do everything that I say as a pastor, a leader, a missionary, whatever you want to call me, then you're going to do it for me and not unto the Lord. And see, the greatest joy and desire that we have to serve God is not what is ahead of us, but what is behind us. Because, oh, we could say, oh, I can't wait to go to heaven, right? I can't wait to meet Jesus face to face and all the apostles and see what heaven is like. It's going to be phenomenal. But really, without the cross, without the death, the burial, and the resurrection, we would have no purpose for why we do what we do. And unfortunately, many people are sitting in churches nowadays that don't know why they're there. They do what everybody tells them to do. They follow the system, pray the prayer, 
go to Bible study, get water baptized, go to church, but why? You see, I, I like for people to have such an encounter with Jesus that they don't serve him because they have to, but because they get to. See, God doesn't want us to be a religious people. He wants us to be relational. He doesn't reveal himself as the CEO and president of Heaven Incorporated. He reveals himself as not apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher. Those are titles that we can give Jesus, God, all those things. But he reveals himself ultimately as father. That means he wants connection with us, not just information in our mind. He doesn't want us just, just to be obedient, although absolutely we need to be obedient. But what causes somebody to be obedient is when they know that they're loved. For God so loved the world. And he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We quote that like, oh yeah, yeah I know that one, you know. But really, for God so loved the world. The purpose of God's love for the world is to reconcile us back to the Father. Not just to forgive us of sin, but to redeem us and bring us back to the Father. Isn't that good? I'm so grateful for God's love. In the Philippines, uh, by the way, we have a little table out back. Uh, as you come in and it has information about our ministry and stuff so you're interested to connect with us further and follow us get on our uh, newsletter list we do a physical and email newsletter you can do that out front and we also have some cool t-shirts that have the name of our ministry which is called revival cry international and it's something that i'm going to talk about here in a minute but uh, if you'd like to look at some of those things at the end, please do. We also have a challenge called the Revival Cry Challenge that uh, please just take a card off the table and with you. And our goal is not just to make our ministry bigger, but to make Jesus bigger in people. And, and what does that mean? That means we want to teach people how to pray. We want to teach people how to value God's Word. And anyway, there's several things on here that we would encourage you to do. There's many people that we know are taking this challenge and to help you to go deeper in the Lord. How many of you want to go deeper with Jesus? Amen? So, uh, you know, how did we get here to Hawaii? It's kind of a, a wild story, and I won't go too long with it. But uh, we left the Philippines in February of 2020. We come to the States every two years as a family. And we come normally for like three, three and a half months. And we normally travel on the east coast of the U.S. I'm from New York. My wife is from the Baltimore area. We met and married in the state of Delaware where I was a youth pastor. And then I got saved. <laughs> kind of backwards sounding, right? And then we went to the Pensacola Revival, the Brownsville Revival. Uh, had any of you ever heard of that revival before? I know your pastor has. Okay, some of you have. It was a revival that took place starting on Father's Day of 1995, and it lasted for about five years. And during that time period, right before the revival started, church prayed for two and a half years intensely for revival to take place. And what is revival? It's when God shows up and everything else changes. <laughs> it's basically an easy definition. But, or when God gets so sick and tired of being misrepresented, he just shows up himself. That's what Leonard Ravenhill said. <laughs> and so God showed up on Father's Day of 95, and in the first six months of the revival, 130,000 people were born again. And it was an amazing move of God. It was the longest lasting local church revival in American history. And it, you know, is, was different than other moves of God that have taken place in America. But uh, it was in response, I believe, to the desperation of the hour that we are still in. God raised up a man named Steve Hill, who's the evangelist. And he was a powerful preacher of the gospel. And he preached every night of that revival for five years. Uh, we would have services uh, every day. And then on Tuesday nights, we'd have prayer meetings. 
And, you know, probably, I think they said within the time period of five years that about four and a half million people visited that revival. So there would be a line that would form in front of church every day, usually about 5, 6 a.m., and the doors would not open to the church until 6 p.m. And, you know, it was so many people standing in line that usually when we went for the first time, by 9 o'clock in the morning, there were 1,500 people in line. And there were oftentimes so many different uh, countries represented. And it, it was phenomenal to see a move of God where God rips open the heavens and comes down and begins to transform hearts. And so we went down there in April of 98. It had already been going on for three years. Your pastor said he went even before we did and went, I think, two or three times. And we went there. Uh, we were, uh, Casey was pregnant with our eldest daughter who's not with us on this trip, named Sierra. She's going to Regent University in Virginia Beach where the Lord gave her a full scholarship, which was a whole nother testimony. And then... Um, she was pregnant seven months with Sierra. We went there. We go back uh, to Delaware, where we, were, where we were living on the East Coast at the time. And the Lord just said, you're moving there. You're going there, and I'm supposed to go to the School of Ministry, Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. And anyhow, we moved there four months later. <laughs> and from that point on, we had no idea what it really was to be a missionary. And we went to Pensacola and encountered Jesus in such a radical way, uh, changed everything about us, broke us free from addictions, restored our marriage, and just did so many things. And we ended up moving to the Philippines in uh, January 2003 with four other families, all of whom either got saved or got right with God at the revival. And uh, I know hundreds of missionaries all over the world that came out of that revival, people that were you know, crack cocaine addicts when they walked into the church immediately set free and 20 years later they're still serving God on the mission field. And it doesn't matter where they are. I know people in Nepal. I know people in China, Japan, all over Southeast Asia, Africa, uh, Europe, that God changed their lives. I, I have friends who were alcoholics 40 years that walk into the doors of that church, were totally set free, never to look back again, and uh, ended up having a deliverance ministry for the last 20 years. I mean, these, these are things that Jesus likes to do. See, when we talk about the resurrection, I'm not just talking about a meeting on Sunday. I'm talking about a powerful God that when we truly, the church really encounters Him, everything changes. Hallelujah. Lord, we want You to change our hearts, that You would speak to our hearts and change our lives today in Your precious name. Amen. We came, uh, we have heard, uh, uh, maybe some of you would know Rod and Marion Hall. They have the Ekbalo School of Ministry, working with Lou Engel. And we've known Rod and Marion since the Brownsville days. And they've been inviting us since they've lived in Hawaii, which I think it's been a few years now, uh, to come. But we just never could come. And since we came to America uh, last February of last year, uh, we or March of last year, we had no intentions but to be here three and a half months. And then all of our meetings got canceled. COVID came, and we've been here since then. And we were quarantined actually in Pensacola for three and a half months. And we're like, Lord, what are you doing? What are you saying? And we uh, eventually just started traveling some in the U.S. And it, it was it was really amazing because. We've probably traveled over 25,000 miles on the East Coast, going to different settings. You know, every church has been different, you know, uh, where some wear masks, some don't wear masks. There's social distancing. I went to New York, where I'm from, and there's a church there. I wasn't sure how many people would actually be, be there, but they kind of defied the governor and all showed up at the same time and we're giving hugs and you know forget about it we you know we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna love God and love Jesus you know I mean too much to explain there anyhow but the power of God moved 
And we've seen God move powerfully all this past year. And honestly, I love America, but I really didn't have much of a burden for America. <laughs> I, love, I love to be in Asia. I'm Asian, if you can't see that, okay? And I, I love to be there with those people because that's where God's called us to. How many Filipinos we got in here? Oh, man, I knew a bunch of y'all were in here, so it's awesome. Well, we're from Mindanao, okay? We live in Davao City, which you know, is quite far from the east coast of America. <laughs> but uh, we, it's really in our hearts there, the Philippines. Anyhow, we, we uh, several years ago, I, was, I go to Japan every year because Japan is less than 1% Christian, maybe 2% some people say. And we've got phenomenal relationships there. And... Uh, working with houses of prayer and local churches, and many Filipino churches, actually. And I was there several years ago in Okinawa, Japan, and I called my dad, who lives in Bradenton, Florida, just south of Tampa, and I said, Dad, we're coming. Hey, be looking out for a vehicle for us, you know, because whenever we travel to and from the U.S., we have to get a vehicle, <laughs> You know, we always have to buy a used vehicle or something, you know, so we can get around because we got a big tribe of people, you know. And, uh, and I said, yeah. He goes, where are you? I said, in Okinawa, Japan. He said, you know, your grandfather who is in the Navy, who I never met because he died when my dad was 18 years old. He said, your dad was, st your, your grandfather was stationed in Okinawa and in the Philippines. He actually helped liberate the Philippines. I never heard that in all my life. I was like, wow, that's pretty incredible because I've been in the Philippines for the last several years up to that point, and we go to Japan. And I'm just thinking, wow, God has a way of kind of redeeming things, you know? And, and I, he said, yeah, he said, your grandfather was stationed in Pearl Harbor right before it was bombed. He said, in fact, he was... He was told by his commanding officer to leave December 6, 1941. As my dad told me that, I'm sitting in Okinawa, just came from the Philippines, and I said, Dad, do you realize that had he been there on December 7th, and his ship that he was on was a destroyer ship called the USS Shaw. It was bombed. There's an iconic picture about the Shaw being bombed. Probably some of you know. And I said, do you realize that if your dad was killed, my grandfather was killed, I would not be talking to you from Okinawa right now. You see, God has destiny and purpose for each and every one of our lives that we don't understand or comprehend the length of time that he's been thinking about it. We fly from Okinawa to Pensacola that same year. And my wife's parents still live there, and, and we're, we always go to the Pensacola Naval Museum because it's, it's free, and you can just kind of go in there, something to do with the kids. And I walk in there, and I said, do you have a, a Pearl Harbor section? He said, yeah, actually, we do. And it's a wall about this size, maybe a little taller. And I walk over there, and it says December 7, 1941. In the middle is a massive picture of a ship being exploded. You know what shrimp ship it was? The USS Shaw. And I stood there, and I wept. As I have many times over the Philippines and over the nations, and say, God, you not only have a purpose for our lives, but you have a purpose for the lives of those that we get to pour into. Because it's really not about us. As your pastor said, it's all about Jesus. And even though we have these testimonies and things that God's done in our heart, it should cause us to look inward and outward and cause us to realize that there's something bigger that God wants to do in the earth. You see, I want to talk to you today about the church bearing God's image. The church bearing God's image. Now, I'm going to go to some different scriptures if you want to keep up with me, you can. I'll be using the NIV version. But in Acts 17, 29, it says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being 
is like gold, silver, or stone, an image made by human design or skill. God is not like us. We are like Him. There's a big difference. We were created in His image. If we try to create a God in our image, that's called idolatry. In Colossians 3, 9 through 11, it says, Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self, you died to yourself with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. In other words, when you get born again, everything changes. You're not your own anymore. You've been bought with a price. I don't, I'm not so much into getting people to just pray a prayer so that they could be saved or just getting them into church. I'm into saying that, do you see your need for Jesus? You see, when a baby is going to be born, all you have to do is guide the head. You don't have to force anything to happen when it's happening, you know, the way God designed it to. So what do we do when we're evangelizing people? We aim for repentance, not so much a decision. When a person truly repents and they understand what that means, the decision that they make at that time, not because they're forced into doing something, they understand that they begin to understand why they believe what they believe. And so I believe people need encounters with God. I believe people don't just need information, but they, it needs to go from here to here. I've, I, I've often said that people are going to miss heaven by 12 inches because sometimes it never gets from here to here. Prayerlessness leads to unbiblical views of what church should look like. Prayerlessness leads to unbiblical views of what God designed the church to look like. I believe many are looking on this Easter Sunday. Remember last Easter of last year? Everybody was saying, oh yeah, let's, let's have all the churches open up on Easter and be done with this COVID thing. But it didn't happen. And I think a lot of people were looking for that same thing again because they just want this thing to be over with. You know, we, we, that people want to go back to normal. Whatever normal was. And I like what your pastor said because I believe in last year the scripture that kept coming to me was Psalm 46 that, that talks about be still and know that I'm God. I'll be exalted in the heavens. I'll be exalted in the earth. That doesn't really make sense to our natural understanding. Being still. Wait, no, no, I've got to be busy i got to be working. i got to be doing something in order for God's kingdom to be advanced. But there's something about being still and knowing that He is God. Because when we know that, and we stop trying to be in control and act like we are God, the greatest revelation I ever had is that He's God and I'm not. No matter how good or how control I think I am, how much knowledge, experience, money, no matter what it is that I think I need or have, I am never going to be Him. You are never going to be Him. So we might as well do something. Surrender. <laughs> I give up. It's all about you. I'm going to stop allowing pride or anything else in this life to dictate who I am in you. Steve Hill used to say all the time at the revival that if pride can make a devil out of an angel, what can it do to you and me? You see, our ultimate issue in life, the root of all sin, is pride. And see, when God is calling His church to a place of prayer, and we don't value prayer the way that God does it, and we think there's another way to do the kingdom of God, God's saying, I'm going to wait and put you aside and teach you how to be still and know that I'm God. Because if you can be still and get revelation of who I am, then you will stop trusting in yourself, and you will fall on your face before me and understand that there is no other name under heaven given amongst men, whereby we must be saved. There 
there is a place. But see, uh, uh, Evan Roberts used to pray the prayer during the Welsh revival. Lord, bend me. Lord, bend me. What does that mean? That means for us to see the value and the reasoning why we need to humble ourselves ultimately before God. Jesus even said it's the meek who will inherit the earth. I love your pastor because he just gave me a mask that says bringing revival back. And I'm going to wear that mask. Because even when they see my, my big mouth... They don't know that's what I'm thinking, but now they're going to know that. I like that. Okay, if you want to cover my mouth, I'm going to put something here for you to see. I believe we're looking for Easter. You know, and, and I had a revelation just coming on way, and I don't know if this is right or not. Maybe you could correct me after. But on our way here, we're looking at the beautiful shoreline here. And I'm thinking, is this the last place on earth that gets to celebrate Easter today? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't, I don't know what else is out there or who else is out there. Maybe there's some guy on some island out there that shows up every now and then, depending on the waves. You know, <laughs> but, but I'm thinking about what an honor it would be for us to end Resurrection Day proclaiming that Jesus is Lord from the very ends of the earth. I like that. I'm not looking just for this day to be the end and the means to all things. I'm not. Because I actually celebrate Resurrection Day every day. I'm not saying in a formal way, but we live like Jesus is alive. Not dead. Not hanging on a cross. He's no longer there. I've, we've been to the tomb. I've been to Israel. It says, He is not here. He has risen. The scripture says it. <laughs> Whether that's the right tomb or not. He's not there. Is that okay with you? I hope so. Because if it's not, then it's a waste of your time being here today. Because if he did raise from the dead, Paul said your faith is in vain. Go home and do something else. But if he's risen, oh, that takes on a whole different mindset. That, that means my life has to shift. If he's risen, then that means I really need to stop thinking that life is all about me and I need to start becoming a man or a woman of prayer. I need to walk with him. Look, I'm not saying everybody's going to be called to move to the Philippines. Maybe you're called to have the business you have. Maybe you're called to live where you are. I, I, I don't know what God's called you to do, but I know this. Whatever you're doing in this life, you should be seeking first the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen? Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. What is the house of God? Does he live in temples made by men anymore? No. This building, when you guys are not here, it's pointless. Did you hear what I just said? When you are not here, it doesn't matter. There's nothing holy about this place. Of, it's holy because you worship here. If you're not here, it's like any other empty building. There's people in the Philippines. There's a, a, a cult there that believes their buildings are going to heaven. Yeah, it's right down the street. We, I think we saw one coming here. I'm not sure. But anyhow, Inglatia ni Cristo. Yeah. I speak out against it because they don't believe that Jesus is God. And that's false doctrine. That's deception. I've tried to go meet with Apollo C. Kibaloi. For those of you who know Philippines, you know Kibaloi, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. He calls himself the appointed son of God. Yeah? He's not. And I've gone to where his ministry is but they wouldn't let me in. And millions of Filipinos follow him. 
He can turn an electoral vote, a, a presidential vote in the Philippines by telling his people who to vote to vote for. Christian leaders in the Philippines have gone and kind of asked for his blessing. To me, they just have enough faith to believe that Jesus could raise them up. Because if you pray, the God who owns and controls everything can make anything happen. <laughs> you don't have to bow to someone who doesn't care about Jesus. Only cares about himself. Anyhow. The sin of prayerlessness always opens the door to more sin. So if we stop praying, how many of you know it's hard to sin and pray at the same time? <laughs> it's hard to sit there and watch pornography when you're praying in the Spirit. It's, it's hard to just, you know, gamble and be like, praise Jesus, hallelujah. doesn't work that way why you, you know you're laughing because you know there's conviction in your heart when you walked in there to go gamble right when you're watching something go would I watch this with Jesus if he was sitting with me right now right we want revival right do, do we want a form of godliness or do we want the power of the gospel I'm not into, look, I've been to so-called revival meetings and there wasn't an inch of power of, in that place. It was just a form of godliness. They sang the songs that everybody else sings. But see, the difference between those places and like your worship team today when they were worshiping is God inhabited the praises of his people. And when God comes down again, everything changes. Hmm. <clears throat> Unrepented sin always leads the church into deeper idolatry. When I was in Delaware as a youth pastor, three and a half years I served. I had 70 teenagers in my youth group. The church grew from 100 to 500 with the pastor I was working with. We were successful. We did special events every month. We did a 4th of July event that would draw 55,000 people to our 40 acres of church property. We would spend $10,000 on uh, fireworks. I would sing the last song in front of everybody with my white top hat and my flag vest. It was the corniest thing you ever seen. I'm not going to show you a picture. Don't ask. But we would do all this stuff and we'd have, you know, a show we'd put on and we'd share the gospel. If you want Jesus, raise your hand. Everybody bow your, you know, head, close your eyes and everything. And maybe people got saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance, right? God uses crazy things sometimes because he loves people. But I, I want to tell you, we did Easter cantatas, Christmas cantatas. I played Peter. I played Joseph. I grew a beard that never really grew in. Like that. This brother is perfect right here. Look at that beard. Could absolutely play Moses, brother. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> But, I, I, you know, and we did that. We, we did the stuff. We did uh, events with the young people. But I was secretly addicted to pornography in my life for seven years. Nobody knew about it except me, Jesus, and the devil. And, and I talk about it because I've been free from it for 23 years. There's absolutely no shame in my life. There's, there's none. And I really don't care what people think. I don't. I'm not here for any other reason except to make Jesus famous. Amen. He did something to me and my wife that nobody else could have done. We were done with. Nobody wanted anything to do with us. We were the rejects. But God forgives. He restores and makes all things new. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we quote, right? 18, we talk about if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Well, if you read the rest of that chapter, it says he's, when you're reconciled to God, you become a minister of reconciliation. I'm here to be a minister of reconciliation. I'm here to say that the resurrection is so real and true today that even though I didn't see Jesus physically raised from the dead 2,000 years ago, he is alive and he lives in my heart. 
He's changed me, friend. He's changed some of you in this place. You know that there's a difference. See, this should remind us of why we pursue the Lord. We only, for the most part, we might get to live 70, 80 years in this life. What are we doing with our life compared to eternity? If we believe we're going to go and be in heaven one day for all eternity with Jesus, then why in the world will we allow this mist of time that we have, this short time in this life, to define the rest of our eternity if we don't submit our lives to God? Whew. At the end of last year, praying, Lord, I want to get out of this country. <laughs> I'd like to go. Love America now. It's wonderful. Can we leave? <laughs> I'm going to take one of those Hawaiian boats pretty soon, you know. Come on. My whole family get in there. <laughs> Might not get very far. But I said, Lord, what are you doing? He, speaking to me in prayer at the end of last year, he said, he said, many have wandered in the wilderness this past year. But he said, I want to give them a voice in the wilderness. And I began to think about the scripture in Romans 8 that talks about all creation is groaning, right? Groaning for what? The sons of God, the daughters of God to be revealed. I said, if creation is groaning for us to be on fire for Jesus to have revival, what happened when Jesus let out his first cry as a baby? What type of cry was heard by creation paying attention? He's here. <laughs> He's here. The Messiah is here. And then when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, which I'm going to read in a moment, it says that he would be groaning. Even when he raised Lazarus from the dead, it said the spirit says that or the scripture says that he groaned. And then the shortest scripture in the Bible, I believe it is, Jesus wept. I believe God's calling his church to weep with him. You see, in a place of prayer, we learn how to take on the nature and character of God. In a place of prayer, we learn to hear the voice of God and we become infatuated with Him. If you're not infatuated with Jesus, I want to ask you, do you know Him? Or do you know about Him? A lot of people know about Jesus. A lot of people can quote Scripture. A lot of people give, give their tithes and offerings. A lot of people sit in church every week, but a lot of people are not intimate with Him. I'm not saying you got to be eight hours a day in prayer. But I am saying, is he first? And, and see, when, when I was thinking about that, uh, I, I was putting a, a, a message together that I spoke over a week ago called Groaning with God. Just God. I think there's three types of prayer. There's number one, there's the intimate prayer that we have, the fellowship with God as a son, as a daughter with our father. Then there's intercession where we're praying for others. Then there's groanings. Groanings where we get gripped with God and we come into alignment with him and we begin to feel what he feels for the lostness of humanity and his desire that all would be saved. And we groan inwardly. So I prayed and I said, Lord, what about that? And all week long I've been thinking about volcanoes. What does a volcano have to do with groaning, God? With weeping. So I, I thought about Mount Apple. Mount Apple, the tallest peak in the Philippines. We live in Davao City. I've actually climbed Mount Apple with my daughter. Not willingly, but I climbed it. And, and when we got up there, I lifted my hands and I said, Lord, revival in the Philippines from the highest point. Amen? So I, he, and that wasn't the, the volcano we was talking about. Then I've been to Sicily and, you know, uh, Mount Etna, one of the most active volcanoes in the world and the most active in Europe. And uh, that wasn't the one. And I've flown by Mount Fuji before. It's such a beautiful, like the perfect volcano look, right? That wasn't the one. I said, God, 
Where? I'm glad you said the name because I didn't want to try to say the name. I was scared to say it. The Lord just prophesied. I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, is there a volcano there? I mean, I knew there were volcanoes in Hawaii, but I had no idea where we were going. I thought Kona was the name of the island. Okay? This is how much Eric knows. No, it's called the Big Island. I think that might have been a cousin of mine naming the island because that's what I would have said. The Big Island! Just call it the Big Island. And so we come here, and what's the volcano? Kilauea. Kilauea. And I look it up, and in 2018 when it erupted, apparently, I was looking at NASA's website, it erupted because of rain. What? That's what I said. I said, rain? What does that mean, Lord? Will it soften the rock? Because it apparently rained for a while. So much so that it caused the eruption to take place. Then the Lord said, when my people will pray and groan and weep with me, it will soften the ground, the hardness of men's hearts, and it will cause a revival to erupt, to explode forth. You see, friend, there's no revival in history that you cannot see the prelude of prayer and intercession. And I'm not talking about prayer, you know, thank you, Jesus, for my food, amen. I'm not talking about, Lord, would you provide for me? I'm not talking about those kind of prayers. I'm talking about the kind of prayers that are prayed when a man or a woman understands the desperation and hour of the hour and they begin to pray desperate prayers. We are in a desperate hour. The whole world is shifting. It's moving. And there's an opportunity, you know, Leonard Ravenhill said, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. We have an opportunity right now to seek the face of God. If my people, right, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, there I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. That is a promise. But that promise comes after we press in. After we stop and be still and know that He's God. And be still for what? Lord, to look into his eyes. Oh, God, I look in your eyes. I see the reflection of lives, of souls. I see your heart for people. I don't have that burden. Give me that burden. Friend, you don't have to do what we're doing to be effective. You have to do what God's told you to do. And I want to ask you, when's the last time you wept over souls? Hmm. When's the last time you were broken? Would you guys give me a few more minutes? Are we okay? Jesus, through the resurrection, defeated sin and death. But his resurrection positioned you and me to be seated with him in heavenly places. When we are born again, we are immediately seated with Christ in heavenly places. It's possible to be in two places at the same time, according to the kingdom. We're seated with him positionally, but we're here on this earth to represent him as his ambassadors. Do you know that everybody in this room is a missionary? Do you know that everybody in this room is an ambassador of Jesus Christ? If you're born again, then you have a responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission, to take the gospel to every nation, tribe, and tongue, whether that be to your neighbors or to somewhere overseas. It doesn't matter. That's what we're called to do. But why don't people do that? Well, we needed an Isaiah 6 encounter. You see, three things happened when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. He sees the holiness of God, which revealed the sin in his own heart, which caused Isaiah to repent. And when Isaiah repented, what happened? He said, 
Here am I, Lord. Send me. The willingness to go comes from your gaze of looking at the Lord's purity and the holiness. Friend, it matters. It matters to be infatuated with Jesus. He's positioned us. Lila Terhune, who was the head intercessor during the Brownsville revival, said this, you will never look more like Jesus than when you are in intercession. I believe God's calling us to stand in the gap this last hour. Turn with me to Matthew 26. I'm just going to read some verses and then we'll go back and we'll be finished. Matthew 26, I'm reading from the NIV. Starting in verse 36, we're going to go to verse 56. It says, Then Jesus, with his disciples, went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Now remember, in the beginning of this chapter, there's the plot to kill Jesus. He's anointed at Bethany, right? Um, Judas betrays Jesus. The Last Supper takes place. Jesus predicts Peter's denial, right? And then what happened? Um, in verse 36, he goes to Gethsemane. Now, how many of you have ever been to Israel? You've been to Gethsemane? Okay. All right. A couple of us. And so we, when, when you go there, it's just a real, it's, it's a beautiful area. It has all these, uh, all, what is it, olive trees, right? Olive trees. And uh, they're really old, some of these trees. And some of them could have been there during the time of Jesus, which is kind of pretty cool to think about. But you could picture Jesus calling his disciples saying, let's go pray. Verse 37, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He's beginning to groan. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his grace, face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but, your, but as you will. Verse 40, Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. The church has been sleeping for a while. I think with COVID, he's trying to wake us up. It's not his perfect will and desire, but God will use whatever he can to get our attention because he wants people to be saved. He wants hearts to be transformed. God wants revival more than you and I do. Couldn't you men keep watch for one hour? He asked Peter. He asked Peter. Now, I don't believe Peter was the first pope of the church. I, I believe he was an apostle called and set apart by God. And he was anointed just like any other of the apostles. And when Jesus referred to Peter on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I don't think he was just talking about one type of church. The Catholic church, the Protestant church, any denomination. I think he was saying that it's people like you who humble themselves before me that I will use. See, we like to elevate people when God said the only one who needs to be elevated is Jesus. Now, I believe in leadership, but leadership in the New Testament is very different. Because we tend to think that leaders are like this, right? On the top of the pyramid. But Jesus kid said that the greatest among you shall become servant to all. The purpose of apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists is not to control the church, but to equip the church. Amen. To do the work of the kingdom. I believe in leadership. But every leader submits to the head. Hebrews tells us there's no other mediator between God and man. Just Jesus Christ. Not the Protestant popes. Not the Catholic popes. Not any other great men or women of God. Because all of us have been born into sin. And all of us need a redeemer. All of us need forgiveness. That means that through repentance you can come directly to Jesus Christ. 
who becomes your mediator, who has become our mediator, he can you can receive forgiveness, and then you can be restored to the Father and have intimate relationship, fellowship with him. Now, sure, people grow in the Lord, and, and they you know, might know more than we do and have more experiences, but ultimately, God wants you and I to recognize that when you pray, there is power in your prayer. If I think the only one who has powerful prayer in this room is the pastor, then what do I do when he's not around? Right? I'm so happy you asked my son to pray for me today because I know him to be a powerful prayer warrior. In fact, I've seen my, all of my kids pray and miracles happen. Supernatural things happen. Why? Because he's no respecter of persons. He's God. He's not impressed with anybody else. I don't care how athletic you are. I don't care how smart you are, how much money you have. I don't care if you came from a royal family. What matters is, is the blood of Jesus applied to your heart. That's all that's necessary. Amen? Verse 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping. This has been a problem in the church for a long time. When we should be prayer, we're sleeping. Because their eyes were heavy, so he left them and went away at once more to pray a third time. Same thing, saying, Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him. Was a, and there was a large crowd of armed with swords and clubs sent from chief priests and elders of people. Sounds like a lot of liberal people. And anyway, now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest them. Going at once to Jesus. And actually, it sounds like some conservatives too. The, going once to Jesus. Jesus said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Speaking to Judas, who walked with him, saw him raise Lazarus from the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, which was Peter, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put it back in your place, Jesus said. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call my father, and he will at once put at my disposal? more than 12 legions of angels, but how then would the Scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, I am, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching you did not arrest me, but this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled and the disciples deserted him and fled. Before Jesus was in the garden, he had already spent the night in prayer. Remember John 17, he's praying that the church would be one like he and the Father are one. He didn't pray for any special individuals. He prayed for all of us. He prayed for those who saw him and those who would not see him. Why is he praying? He's praying and preparing the church to experience revival if we would just simply come into alignment with God in the place of prayer. In the garden, even though Jesus asked three times, do you want this, to, this cup to pass for me? If not, your will be done. He was completely at peace. Peter, however, was not at peace. Peter, we see, was not at peace because he kept sleeping trying to escape the reality of what's going on. And he probably wasn't disciplined enough to spend time in prayer. And then what happened when Jesus is getting arrested, he pulls out his sword and cuts the ear off of Malchus, the, one of the servants of the high priest. Peter wanted to defend Jesus, listen, when Jesus didn't need his help. Let me ask you, friend, do you think Jesus needs your help and my help? What in the world do we think that we can do to add to what God can do? You see, the place of prayer 
causes us to humble ourselves and say, God, we don't know what's going to happen, but we know that you said, my temple is your house of prayer. Mm. When the church is idolized outside of the posture of prayer, we dangerously deny Jesus from being the head of the church. Let me say that again. When the church is idolized outside the posture of prayer, we dangerously deny Jesus from being the head of the church. We try to lead. Let me do that, Jesus. Do what? Can you heal that body? Can you cast out that demon? Can you provide for that need? What can we do? Nothing. What makes us think that we could do something? Pride. Prayer is the ultimate act of humility. The more that we become a people of prayer, the more the heart of God is given to us, and the more that we see, taste, hear, and feel because we transition out of the mind of this life and into the kingdom where we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, we start having a vision for what God wants us to have vision for. When we stop giving Jesus the focus and honor he deserves, we stop valuing prayer. When he's not first, and we are, or somebody else is, or something else is, prayer always gets devalued. Leonard Ravenhill said, he's one of my favorite authors, he said uh, one time that on Sunday morning would tell you how popular the church is. Sunday night service will tell you how popular the preacher is. Wednesday night will tell you how popular the ministries of the church are. And the Saturday morning prayer meeting tells you how popular God is. The, I'm not wanting anybody to feel condemned. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. If you feel condemnation, then we're slaves. But sons are disciplined because he loves us. And we feel conviction to do what's right because he's our heavenly father. And so the place of prayer, if we feel God shaking us to wake us up this morning, is because he's saying, I have a greater purpose that you don't see beyond your own life. Prayer is not a concept or a work of many other important things in the church. Prayer is the cornerstone of the church. What do you mean, Eric? Isn't Jesus the cornerstone? I'm glad that you asked. In Hebrews 7.25, it says, Therefore, he, speaking of Jesus, is always able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Since he always, say always, lives to make intercession for them. When Jesus rose from the dead, you know what happened? He ascended to the Father. And for the last 2,000 years, he has been in a place of 24-7 intercession. Now, I want you to understand this because I got this revelation the other week and it kind of shook me. If Jesus has been in that posture of prayer for 2,000 years, he's the head of the church. You would agree with that? We were created in his image, right? If the head has been doing this for so long, how can the church not want to look like him? You know what we like to say and look like Jesus? I want to heal the sick. I want to cast out devil. I like to do that stuff. One of my favorite things is to see demons come out of people. What are you talking about, Eric? That's kind of wild. Just come with me on a missions trip sometime. Be happy to take you. And you will see people get set free. Not because of me, but because greater is he who's in me. <laughs> and when Jesus shows up, things change. And we carry him with us. Everywhere we go, we see God move. 
I'm not saying like we're some supernatural, set apart, more important people than anybody else in this world. No, my whole message today is to say, you can do these things. And you don't have to actually do exactly what we're doing. But you can still demonstrate the kingdom. How? Are you a man or a woman of prayer? If Jesus has been doing this for 2,000 years, then this is the problem that the church is having. Is that we are in danger of coming up with our own concepts of what church should look like. Our idolatry personally is trying to change what the church should look like. Let me ask you this. Because people say, well, what should the church look like? Well, we go back to the Word of God. The book of Acts. Do you know that the book of Acts is normal Christianity? You believe the Bible, right? It's okay. And say a bad word. Because all of you looked at me like a deer in headlights. Maybe, I don't know if you guys have deer here. But maybe you do. Or an animal crossing the road. You know? <laughs> if you don't get it, it's okay. They don't get it in the Philippines neither, and I don't know why I say it there. Because they ate all the deer over there. <laughs> Without being a house of prayer, we don't look like the early church. We have to get back to normal. Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone with the, which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. They're talking about Jesus. Remember when I said that prayer is the cornerstone of the church? It's because Jesus is that man of prayer. And if he's the cornerstone of the church, he has represented to us that prayer is the cornerstone of the church. I thought it was interesting. I'm going to close with this. I thought it was interesting that Peter cut off the ear of Malchus. Why didn't he do something else? Was he aiming for something else? I don't know. Maybe he was just not good with the sword. He was, he was a fisherman, you know. But he came out, sliced off the ear. And this is after Peter just heard Jesus say moments before that you're going to deny me three times. I'm not going to deny you. Not me. Jesus gets arrested. Peter is in stealth mode, right? He's hiding. Doesn't want anybody to see who he is. And then somebody recognizes him and says, Hey! You were with him. You're from Galilee. Not me. Strike number one. Number two. Number three. He puts his head down. Feeling guilty. Why was it interesting that he cut off Malchus' ear? Because I don't think he was hearing God like he thought he was. And so many of us, if we're not a people of prayer, we're striking out at others, saying, we know what to do. And God's saying, Where's my people? Where are the ones who are going to pray? I, I did not come here today to say, come on, guys, let's get excited. Let's, let's get excited. Woo, resurrection day. Awesome. Because we're going to leave here today. And I think we'll be back Wednesday, so I look forward to that. And we'll have probably a little bit more fellowship time, unless we're able to do that as well here. But what I feel God's called us to do in America is to stir people to prayer. Is to stir people. Because I can't make revival happen. Some, some churches I've been to, when people heard we went to the Brownsville Revival, and they see our videos, and they see us preaching in front of thousands of people, and all these testimonies and things happening. They say, this is Eric and his family, and they're here to bring revival today. 
I go, oh, dear God. We can't do that, Jesus. I just want you to know that's what he said. That's not what I'm saying. Because, man, I've experienced real revival. I'm still experiencing real revival. The revival's been over since 2000. But in my heart, personal revival burns. It's gotten brighter. I love him more. My kids love Jesus. My wife, our marriage, we love Jesus. The people that we left in the Philippines, they're on fire right now. Despite the lockdown and the hardship what's going on, they're still feeding 100 kids every week. They're still going after God. They're still doing the work of the kingdom. Some of them might be watching right now, and I'm so proud of you guys. Because you don't need us as much as you need him. And though we want to be there with you because we love you, I am confident that Jesus in you is enough to do what God's called you to do. Friend, we've poured out our life for 17 years in a place. That's why I talk like that. And I have no idea what's next. We, we might end up in your backyard, Pastor. We might be living with you sometime. I don't know. Might be moving in. I, I have no idea. I really don't. And I don't need to know, actually. Because I'm so content to be in a place of prayer, as Leviticus 6, 13 says, to just keep the fire on the altar burning. I'm going to wear my mask. We're going to preach revival everywhere we go. We're going to challenge people and God's going to move. Listen, some of you today, you need a fresh encounter with God. And we do want to give you an opportunity. And there can't be a better day than Resurrection Day. Look, if you're on fire, if you're a man, woman of prayer, then praise God, man. Keep going for it. But if there's something separating you from God, if there's a sin that's trying to control your life and cause you to be a slave and a master to sin, for I want to tell you there's freedom in Jesus. I don't want people to just be saved to go to heaven. I want people to be saved to know what God's purpose is for them in this life. I have no greater joy. We're teaching at this Bible school this week and next week. What an honor. We'll go anywhere. I don't need crowds of people. Whoever God calls us to, we're going to go and minister to them. Because we never know who we're pouring into. We might be pouring into the next Billy Graham. That's his, that's his stuff. That's not mine. It's not yours. Would you stand with me for a moment? Father, I shared what I feel like you wanted to say today. And I pray that as it has gone forth, that none of the words would drop to the ground that are necessary. And that like arrows, they would go into our hearts today and we would say, Lord, I, I really desire personal revival. I really desire to become a man or a woman of prayer. I don't want religion. I want relationship. I want to humble myself before you and give my sin to you because you already died for it and you love me. And I don't want anything to separate me from you, but I want you. I want to know you. I want to live the full, abundant life that's not just about having more things in this life, but being devoted to you in every way. I want to lay my life down for you as you laid your life down for me. What an honor to be called your son and your daughter.